In Beyond the Boundary, you make the connection between democracy and, I think, cricket. How important is Beyond the Boundary for you? I don't know that I made a connection in that way between democracy and cricket. What I referred to was that the development of democracy coincided with, and in my opinion, affected the development of cricket. That is a different thing from what some might think that in cricket there is democracy now. Oh, no, no, oh, no, I thought the, that you, the whole question of the Athenian democracy grew up around the whole question of sports. Yes. And you make that connection between what is the manifestation of sports and its sort of correlative. democracy in, in Western civilization, in Britain and the Dominion. Yes, certainly. I think that the two are very close. First of all, just let me say maybe a few words about um, C.N.R. James, the man, and the historical context out of which he emerged. Um, as we all know, he was born just at the beginning of the last century, 1901. And um, he grew up in that part of Trinidad, which has always been very much a cradle, I think, of the African Trinidadian consciousness and particularly the political and social consciousness. Well, I think perhaps there have been two cradles because um, suburbs of Port of Spain like Woodbrook and Belmont have also been cradled. But the other important milieu out of which at least three great figures who pioneered pan-Africanism and global diaspora thinking came out of that small area between Tunapuna and Aruka along what Lloyd Best has christened the East-West Corridor. Um, I'm speaking, as you know, of Henry Sylvester Williams, who was born and grew up in Aruka. Um, Malcolm Nurse, better known to history as Malcolm Padmore, who also was born and grew up in the same area. And then Sienna James, who actually apparently wasn't born in Tunapuna, but certainly grew up in Tunapuna. So something about that suburban area, first settled by former enslaved people and liberated African immigrants in the middle decades of the 19th century, something about that area nurtured um, a sort of upper working class, a lower middle class sector of society where the families were extremely strongly oriented to education, but not only to formal education, at which they tended to excel, also oriented to a social consciousness and an openness to ideas of pan-Africanism and diaspora. So I think that's the milieu that James came out of. We're very fortunate that James has written extensively about his own socialization and his own education. Um, his famous book, Beyond the Boundary, is so much more than a book about cricket also an extraordinary literary and intellectual autobiography of James and he speaks there very um, very perceptibly and very movingly about the social context which shaped him and the individuals who shaped him. His mother interested me more than his father, I might have thought it would have been the headmaster father, but he says more than once that it was his mother's passion for reading which shaped his early childhood. And of course, his famous chapters on Queen's Royal College, that magnificent school, which again was the cradle for so many of the great figures of um, 20th century China. So we're lucky that we know a great deal, I think, about his intellectual biography. Another interesting thing about James is that um, he certainly did not go with the conventional route for brilliant, young, African, Caribbean, intellectuals of the first half of the 20th century. His younger contemporary, Eric Williams, did go that route, but James did not. Um, James says in his autobiography that he simply didn't bother to study hard enough to get one of the famous island scholarships. I, I don't think anyone has any doubt he had the intellectual ability to have one of those one, one of those scholarships if he had chosen to, but he says he simply didn't. He had other interests when he was a student at Queen's Royal College. So he, in fact, um, did not win an island scholarship, did not go to university. So another interesting thing for us to reflect about is that C.L.R. James 
never at any point in his long life was a student or a registered student of any university. And so his intellectual achievements were created outside the formal academic setting. And later in life, as a much older man, he certainly had stints in American and British universities, but he, he was never the product of a formal university training. We noticed, too, that um, James was already over 30 when he left Trinidad. He left Trinidad in 1932, and he was born in 1901. Um, so you can say he was a fully formed intellectual and individual before he began his wanderings um, to Britain, to the United States, back to Britain, to Trinidad for that short very interesting period when he was collaborating with Eric Williams and so on. Um, now you asked um, specifically about Black Jacobin. Yes. What an extraordinary book that is and was. It's, um, as we all know, when we study historiography, we have to put any historical work in its context. We have to understand the history. This was a book that was published in 1938. It was um, researched when James went to England. So it was researched in the middle 1930s. Here is a man with no formal exposure to the university. Here is a man who was almost entirely self-educated. Even when he was at QRC, you get the strong impression he was basically educating himself. Who took on a rigorous piece of historical research. Um, Black Jacobins, while it certainly does have a strong ideological element to it, it is also a very fine piece of original historical research. James spent time in the archives in Paris. His command of French was obviously excellent because he was reading very, very difficult, voluminous documents in late 18th century, early 19th century French in the colonial archives in Paris and other cities. He extensively researched in the British archives, particularly what was then the uh, British Museum. Of the British Library and of course the public record office um, in London. So this was a work based on very extensive archival research. Secondly, um, it was an extraordinary act to choose this topic because we have to now Haiti and the Haitian Revolution and Toussaint and, and Dessalines and all of them. Now those events and those individuals are very much at the forefront of our thinking and our consciousness. So as we think about the end of the trade in enslaved Africans, as we think about the struggle against slavery, we put Haiti at the center of our consciousness. But that wasn't by any means the case in the 1930s. That extraordinary story, the Haitian Revolution, had been conveniently forgotten by everybody except the Haitians. The Haitians, of course, never forgot. And there was a very extensive, there was and is, a very extensive literature coming out of Haitian historians, mostly published in Haiti, some, some in Paris, but mostly published in Haiti and naturally in French. And that literature remained very much in a closed circle. Haitian intellectuals knew about it, but it was hardly known outside Haiti. And generally, as I said, the Western world had chosen to forget that remarkable story. So for James to deliberately choose that as a topic for his magnum opus um, was in itself a remarkable testament to his developing um, global consciousness, diaspora consciousness, pan-Africanism, and so on. Um, it's a remarkable book. It's an extremely dense book. It's, it's a very long book. Um, I personally have found that undergraduates struggle, struggle with the book. Um, perhaps it's a little more suitable for, you know, for higher level students. But there is absolutely no question that it is a great classic of Caribbean historiography. And for a long time, I think, we have all said correctly that the modern era of Caribbean historiography was ushered in by two works, both of them by Trinidad. Um, Black Jacobins, published in 1938, and Eric Williams' PhD thesis. He was awarded his degree in 1938, so it was a coincidence there. It wasn't published until 1944, 
as capitalism and slavery, but the, the research had been done in Oxford at the same time that James was in England in the late 1930s. So I think those two books really um, propelled us into the modern era of anti-colonial, post-colonial Caribbean historiography. So Black Jacobins is extraordinary for the um, enormous amount of primary archival research that went into it. It's extraordinary for the choice of the topic. It's extraordinary for the complexity of the story that James tells. Um, the way he can weave almost effortlessly between the complicated events in France, the global events, the war between Britain and France and Spain, and the very, very almost Byzantine <laughs> complexity of the revolution itself as it unfolded. Toussaint is his central, his central character, but he is also telling an extremely complicated story involving French royalists, counter-revolutionaries, emissaries of the Republican Jacobin governments in Paris, Spain, the policies of the Spanish crown, and of course the policies of Britain, who unsurprisingly um, felt that the revolution and the civil war was their opportunity to invade and hopefully to take over what, as you know, was by far the most lucrative and the most profitable of all the Caribbean economies in the um, late 18th century. So it's an extraordinary book. It will always be a classic. Um, of course, as you're very well aware, he wrote it, well, he wrote it in the late 30s. It was published in 1938. So uh, the resonances with the international world of the late 1930s clearly were very much in, um, in James's mind. When he published, by the way, interestingly, the book was not widely read at the time it was published. Uh, there were a few reviews, but it, it wasn't widely read. Maybe his timing was bad. The, the attention of the world was about to be focused on the, the war and all those things. Um, but when he issued a second edition, I can't remember the exact date, but it was sometime in the 1960s, yes. he did include a very interesting um, introduction to the second edition, where he sought to tie the story that he told in Black Jacobins with the story of African resistance to colonization and African decolonization in the 1950s and 1960s. So that essay, I think, is a, is a very, very interesting essay. Sure. I think Black Jacobins is a book that has stood the test of time. It's, it's a classic. Um, certainly in the history department, we say that any serious graduate student in history should have read Black Jacobins. It's, it's, it's an absolute classic. I think it remains the single most important work in English on the Haitian Revolution. There have been very good um, more recent narratives in English, for example, by Caroline Fick, who is a Canadian scholar, and much more recently by a young American scholar called Laurent Dubois, who has written an excellent work, I think it's called Avengers of the New World, which is an uh, English language narrative of the revolution, which owes a great deal to Black Jacobins, as Dubois quite, um, quite freely acknowledges in the introduction. But I would say it has retained its place as a classic English language um, narrative of the events of the Haitian Revolution. Interesting. Uh, I think Manny Marabou told me that James may have been influenced to some extent by W.E.B. Du Bois, whose uh, Black Reconstruction in America came out a couple of years before the Black Jacobin. But I'm not sure I saw that link directly in the citations. As you said, James used the uh, original materials. He said he did. I know that's an interesting suggestion. Yeah. Um, probably he had read Dubois. Okay. But um, no, I don't remember that he cited it. No. I, I, don't, I don't see a direct connection. But okay. James was immensely well read. He's so um, he probably had read um, some of Dubois' um, yes. works. He certainly was very, very widely read in the historiography of the French Revolution, mm -hmm. as it was. Up to, up to the time that he wrote Black Jacobins. Mm -hmm. He certainly knew that literature, particularly the literature that was coming out from French social left-wing yes. historians who were seeking to recast the revolution as a class, essentially a class struggle. Yes. There, there is a critical commentary on the Black Jacobins that say 
says that uh, James may have given too much credence to the French Revolution and to the influence of the Enlightenment on the enslaved and less to the American traditions and belief systems that they may still have retained very much at that time and that may have influenced their revolution in Haiti. I think he gave only six pages to their belief in voodoo but did not dwell on that uh, as much as he dwelt on the materialist conditions that they were struggling against. As a historian, what would you say about it? Well, it's, it's a fair comment. Yeah. It's a fair comment. And we can look at it from different points of view. Um, as you said in your last comment there, um, James was a Marxist um, scholar. He was a Marxist historian. And um, certainly he followed that tradition by foregrounding economic and material considerations. So I think, and, and, and as I had just said earlier, he was influenced by your historians who were very, very prominent in academia in the 1920s and 1930s, particularly on the continent. But even in England, there were some famous socialist historians who were influential. Um, so unquestionably, he saw the Haitian Revolution primarily in broad Marxist terms. I mean, he was never a dogmatic Marxist, as we know, but he certainly shared the basic framework. So he did see it as basically a class struggle. Um, based essentially on the material conditions. And um, famously, he proposed that the great sugar plantations, the great coffee plantations of saint um, were very comparable to large industrial complexes, and therefore that the enslaved labor force um, shared a broad class consciousness with the proletariat in Europe. So I mean, that was part of his his political and intellectual worldview. Now, as the historiography has progressed, certainly far more attention has been paid to, um, well, first to African influences on the Haitian Revolution, and more generally on the resistance of the enslaved everywhere in the country. And secondly, on internal, if you like, Creole, consciousness forged within the Caribbean out of a fusion of African, European, possibly American kinds of, um, kinds of ideas. But you must always put a book in its, com in its context, as I said. It, it, it would perhaps have been, well, unfair to have expected a book published in 1938 to reflect those kinds of understandings which have been developed in much more recent years. Uh, but certainly many scholars, I, I can think of off the top of my head, the American scholar John Thornton, who has written extensively about the role of African military and political ideologies on the Haitian Revolution, particularly the Kikongo influence, which was so strong in um, 1790s San um, They particularly have emphasized that African military tradition and indeed, the fact that among the enslaved people brought to saint domingue particularly in the 1770s and 1780s, were probably quite a large number of actual soldiers, people with military experience. Um, and also Thornton has written very interestingly about the role of um, West and Central African political ideologies on the course of the revolution and what happened in independent Haiti. So clearly those were aspects of the story which um, James either ignored or downplayed. There, there's no question about that, no, no quarrel. Um, the same, interestingly, the same, contradict, the, same, uh, the same criticism has also been made of capitalism and slavery, where Jane, whereas, um, William showed relatively little interest in considering the role of the enslaved bringing about the end of slavery. Incidentally, an interesting little sideline, the thesis which Williams um, wrote at Oxford did not include a chapter on the contribution of the slaves to emancipation. The thesis doesn't have that chapter. The book, Capitalism and Slavery, has a last chapter. It's short, 
but at least there is a chapter in which Williams briefly mentions the role of resistance and rebellion by the state. And that chapter was included in the book on the suggestion of C.L.I. James. Um, C.L.I. James had, as we all know, considerable influence on Williams. And um, when, when Capitalism and Slavery was being written, the revised thesis, Williams was at Howard University in the States. And by that time, James was in the States. James left England for America in 1938. So James and Williams were together. Um, and James spent some time in Washington, some time in, in New York. They were together and in constant correspondence during the period that Williams was revising his thesis and writing capitalism and slavery. Um, so clearly James had a very strong consciousness of the role of the enslaved and other groups in bringing about emancipation. But I, I think it's, it's fair to say that he had, at that stage anyway, not a great deal of interest, perhaps, in the Afro-Creole cultural fusion that Baudin represented and that we now know played a huge role in the events in Haiti. Yes. Um, that's an interesting uh, observation, the movement of James and Williams to America about the same time. Very interesting Very coincidence, am I say? Um, <laughs> good, point. Um, yeah. good point. I'm not sure exactly why James went to America in 1938. Williams, we know, went because Oxford wouldn't give him a fellowship. Okay. And he saw possibilities in Howard. Um, it's also possible that both men wanted to be outside Europe with the coming of war. Oh, right. Uh, that's possible. I don't know. I don't know if anyone has explored that. But no. 1938 wasn't a bad time to leave to leave, yes. to leave Europe. You know, um, so it is interesting. But they were certainly in frequent correspondence mm -hmm. during that period. Um, you, you probably know that um, somebody has published. I think it was a, was it Anna Grimshaw has published the correspondence between C.L.R. James and his second wife, yes. Constance Webb. Well, yes. And in that correspondence, Williams figures frequently, quite frequently. Yes. So um, James often writes about Williams in his letters to Constance Webb. It's clear that they were in frequent, frequent correspondence. Yeah, were there many replies to those letters? Because what we see are mostly James's letters. That's exactly right. I, I don't know. I noticed, though, I haven't read it yet. I noticed that Constance Webb, who may still be alive, um, has recently published an autobiography. Oh, okay. and I want to read that. That's the her side of the relationship. Because okay. as you say, the book, which is fascinating, is basically immensely long letters from James. <laughs> from James to her because they were separated for, mm. for much of their courtship and marriage, they were, they were separated. So um, you don't get a very good sense of concepts and stuff. So I want to read the autobiography to get, to get a sense of that. Interesting. So I don't know what happened to those letters. Okay. I don't know if they're in any of the many collections of James' papers, because as you probably know, James's papers were, are scattered now. We have some in yes. the UE library, and there's another large, large group of papers said to be under the control of Bobby Hill in the United States. Yes. And a third cache in Britain, not too sure mm. where they are. Some in Columbia University. Somewhere? In Columbia University. I didn't even know that. Yes, I just talked to uh, Manny Marable and he said okay. that James yeah. Institute right. bequeathed right. their collection. That's based at Columbia? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is a question that is raised by James' reading of Hegel, and in the context of Hegel's dismissal of African contributions to history, and now your emphasis from the point of view of James on the contributions of the enslaved Africans to their own liberation, it makes it more, even more puzzling for me that James celebrated Hegel all the way through in his notes on dialectics without bringing his usual critical expertise to bear on the reading of Hegel. Do you have any idea as to why he chose to do this? No, I don't. You're right, it's intriguing. Um, I'm ashamed to say I've never read his notes on dialectics. Okay. It, it's intriguing. It's intriguing. Um, I, I don't know. I think, um, I wonder if this is correct. I think James, well, James always had a pan-African consciousness. Yes. I think that is quite clear. Yes. 
but I think it was later in his life that he came to be very, very centrally interested in Africa itself. Mm -hmm. You can have a pan-African consciousness without necessarily being particularly interested in the history and culture of Africa itself. And I think perhaps he reached that a bit later in life. Now obviously, and this is a point that's been made over and over again, James's um, thought and work can be said to embody a key contradiction. Mm -hmm. He was a Marxist, first and last, and therefore he saw historical events through the prism of class struggles. And as we said earlier, he looked at the enslaved people of San Haiti essentially in class terms. They were an oppressed class and partially influenced by the ideologies coming out of revolutionary France. They rose up against their class of presence. Obviously then, um, logically, there is a contradiction there between um, a class view of historical evolution and one that is more based on a sense of um, Africa and African consciousness and pan-Africanism. And um, without claiming to know too much about it, it seems to me that James did always swing, sort of swing between those two ideological constructs. Mm -hmm. um, I think later in life, he swung more clearly towards the African, pan-African mm -hmm. views, perhaps. At the time he wrote Black Jacobins, I mean, I think he was first and foremost, as I said, a, a Marxist scholar. And I think he saw Black Jacobins as a contribution to the growing socialist Marxist literature about the creation of modernity and the creation of the modern world. Mm. And uh, perhaps secondarily, as a contribution specifically to Caribbean historiography or to Pan-African historiography. But as you know, James was um, an, an immensely learned man. Uh, he was very widely read. He made no apology for his intellectual formation being grounded in European literature. Yes. He made no apology for that, never did. Um, he said he was formed by his reading of the great European classics. Ah, and when he discovered Marxism, he was formed by the reading of the great scholars, Marx himself and all the other great scholars. So he, 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 um, he, he never apologized for that. So I, I suppose that that is part of the explanation. Mm. Yes, there is a a sense in the Black Jacobins where he says that uh, the despite the violence and brutality that the enslaved Africans endured, that they were remarkably forgiven to their former enslavers when the revolution succeeded, that they didn't proceed to kill everybody or even try to enslave them in vengeance, and then he saw a similar pattern of history across the African world uh, after co colonialism was uh, ended, that there was no great urge for vengeance. But st still, in the, uh, in the book Beyond, Beyond a Boundary, he gives the impression that this polished civilization was perhaps due to the influence of cricket, the idea that you should uh, be not boastful, that you should commend the other team and say well played, that, <laughs> that that was part of the civilizing influence of cricket, rather than say this, the African philosophy of nonviolence that Gandhi learned in South Africa, according to Gandhi. Well, whatever. Um, certainly <laughs> cricket could not have influenced the people of Sandama, Haiti. No. Um, the, 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 the Haitian Revolution was a, a terrible business. I mean, it was an extremely bloody, protracted revolution, civil war, and uh, atrocities did happen on both sides, mm -hmm. and I think Celia um, James doesn't hide that. But when you consider what could have happened, then you do have to conclude that the um, rebel forces in Sandaman, Haiti, and the authorities once Haiti had been established as an independent state were relatively merciful to those um, former slave owners, former planters, French whites who were still in Haiti. Of course, many of them, you know, thousands of them fled and uh, got, got out of Haiti. So I think that, that is a valid point.
when you think of what could have happened, then you have to say that the um, the Sandemar whites were pretty lucky. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> I suppose that James uses cricket as, as a metaphor, perhaps, as a metaphor. I think he's trying to say that um, there, are, there are aspects of European civilization, British civilization, there are aspects of British colonialism which may have not been wholly negative in their influence on the colonized people. Now, James is a very sharp critic of imperialism and colonialism. So, I mean, no way can you say this fellow is an apologist no. for British colonialism and so on. No way. And I mean, I think people who deduce from his love of cricket or his love of Thackeray, people who deduce from that that he's an apologist or a stooge for British colonialism, you know, couldn't be, couldn't be more wrong. But at the same time, he was, it's obvious from his writings, um, an extremely um, open-minded man, a very generous sort of minded man. And I think he used cricket as a metaphor for those aspects of colonial education and the colonial experience, which may have had positive effects. Um, but I don't think anyone can seriously make an argument that it was British civilization exemplified in cricket and literature and schools like QRC. I don't think anyone can seriously argue that those influences were what um, shaped this, as you say, um, anti-violence policy. We see it all over Africa, all over Africa, South Africa most, most obviously now, but earlier we saw it in um, all over Africa. No, I don't know if he, he seriously thinks that. But yes, he does think that cricket was an important shaping influence on people in the Anglophone Caribbean in the 20th century. QLC in its days of glory, like its Roman Catholic counterparts in there, were elite schools. But there's no point in fudging that. They were elite schools to which you got access only if, one, your parents were well-to-do and could afford the fees, or two, you were one of that tiny group of brilliant young boys who won what used to be called college exhibitions. In effect, they were free places um, to QRC or St. Mary's, which you won on the basis of fiercely competitive examinations. And the number of free places was very, very limited in the first half of the 20th century. So it was very much an elite school. And of course, it was, as James has brilliantly evoked in Beyond the Boundary, also very much a British school. And again, no apologies were made for that. And the parents of, pe of boys like C.L.R. James would have objected strongly to any attempt to water down the British element because obviously their thinking, and it was a perfectly reasonable thinking, was um, why should our boys, our brilliant boys who have won these three places, get a watered down type of education? We want the same education that brilliant British boys are getting in, in Britain. So it was um, a British form of education, everybody understands that. Um, they didn't teach anything approaching Caribbean history or geography until well after World War II. Um, so what James was taught, what Eric Williams was taught, was um, British, European history, culture, geography, literature, mm. Latin and Greek, and all the rest, all the rest of it. Um, so it was an elitist form of education, but it was also a highly disciplined form of education. It was a highly literary education. Mm -hmm. Remember that these boys had no TV. Indeed, James grew up without radio, because radio came to Trinidad, I think, basically in the late 1930s. Mm -hmm. They certainly had the cinema, and uh, the cinema but um, it was a highly literary kind of, of education. Um, I don't know if we can ever reproduce anything like that. I don't know if we can, but obviously we have an obligation, all of us, have an obligation to try to make sure that now we are firmly in the era of mass education. That's true at the secondary level and it's becoming true at the tertiary level too. Um, now we're in an era of universal mass secondary education and moving towards an era where 50 to 60 percent of young people will go on to some type of tertiary education. It's the business of you and me to make sure that um, we try not to compromise quality as we open our doors to admit more and more.
I do suspect, though, that worldwide, we're never quite going to recapture that intensely disciplined, literary-based type of education, as I think young people have moved into a, a different type of um, consciousness mm -hmm. and so on. Um, one, one interesting thing is that Eric Williams deliberately gutted QRC in the early 1960s when his government had made the decision to vastly expand secondary school places and allow everybody who passed the common entrance, as it was called, to uh, allow everybody access to a free secondary education. And so he was busily creating new secondary schools. He gutted QRC quite deliberately took all the experienced, brilliant teachers out of QRC and appointed them headmasters of the new secondary schools. And historians of QRC date the decline of QRC from, from that moment, which is interesting. But what happened was that from being you know, one of the two or three top secondary schools for boys, it sort of became one of many. And I guess that was inevitable. That, that, that in itself is inevitable. So clearly we can never quite go back to that era, but hopefully at least we can try to combine, to, to stick to quality as the era of mass education uh, develops. It's uh, a visionary commentary um, on the mission of UWE as an institution. I understand that James studied university systems in the third world, Okay, before setting up you, we rather than studying the universities in, say, Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard, he was more interested in universities we are administered in the third world. But despite James' uh, elitist education at QRC, he was uh, wonderfully committed to the ordinary person. In his novel, Minty Ali, where this guy gave up his inheritance, well, he didn't quite give it up, he rented it out to go and room with the poorer people uh, as a matter for, for his own privileged education that he somehow gave up to live a life of almost poverty. Uh, but in his essay or book, booklet, Every Cook Can Govern, he was wonderfully praising the Athenian democracy as a model that gave equal opportunities to everybody despite the institution of slavery and despite the deprivation of uh, rights to women and children in Athens. But again, it makes me wonder why Athens as a model of democracy despite those flaws? Well, for the reasons we've said, he was a an intellectual firmly grounded in the Western intellectual the classics, tradition, yeah. the classical and Western tradition. And I think he would have instinctively looked to Athens. Mm -hmm. um, he would have instinctively looked to Athens rather than to a any other model. Mm -hmm. um, because he was a Marxist, um, I think he certainly had a tremendous respect for the ordinary people. He, and, and as a Trotskyite, mm -hmm. he believed in the masses organizing and so on, so he didn't accept the notion of a vanguard party and organized the elitist Leninist type of party and so on. So yes, I think that was a, a very basic part of his understanding. At the same time, he knew himself to be an immensely cultured man, mm -hmm. an immensely erudite, widely read and cultured man. Because remember, culture in its broadest sense was immensely important to him. Um, so I, I think there might have been a little tugging and pulling, mm -hmm. <laughs> pulling, pulling there. I think he was a natural elitist in a sense. I, I think, well, the mind, the qualities of the mind and the culture and the meaning. But politically and ideologically, you are absolutely right. He stood for an ideology that said every cook can govern. He rejected notions of vanguard parties and he wanted, he was interested in notions of mass. Mass risings, that's why, um, as a very, very old man, he was so fascinated, for example, by what happened in Poland, mm -hmm. the Solidarity Movement, which he watched very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. And he saw that as an excellent example of what he had always hoped for, mm -hmm. an almost spontaneous rising of proletariats. You know, it was based, you remember, in the Gdansk shipyards and so on. And he saw that as a kind of model of what he thought could um, bring the ordinary working people onto center stage. Mm. So.
Maybe it's just as well he died in Nigeria. <laughs> yeah, oh, he wouldn't know that most of the shipyard workers are unemployed now. <laughs> and, 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 and much else. <laughs> and much else. Yes. Interesting, uh, the point you made that he was a cultured man. Mm -hmm. There has been some documentation of his love for Mozart yes. and for Picasso. And art and literature, theatre and cinema. Yes. Cinema. He yes. loved the Yes, American. and soap opera. And soap opera. Yes. He, he was an extremely gorgeous cultural man, and his cultural interests seem to have been extraordinarily wide. Yes. But what do you say as a historian about his essay on castaways and renegades, uh, his essay on Moby Dick, when he was in detention and yeah. fighting deportation, that he was trying to convince the authorities that he was very, every inch as American as apple pie? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I read those so long ago, I can't quite remember. But I mean, I think James genuinely loved America. Yes. Now, this sounds odd, but let's not think about Bush's America. <laughs> I think James was fascinated by America. I think he loved America. America in the 1930s, well, late 30s, 40s, now, must have been an extraordinarily exciting place. He was immersed in the world of left-wing intellectuals in New York. He loved American cinema. He thought American pop culture was the, the way the world was going. You know? um, so I think his love for America was quite genuine. And, and um, I, I don't think that was um, a tactical move to persuade Washington not to deport him. Anyway, of course, it failed. If it was, it failed since they, they did indeed deport him. Um, but I think he loved America. I think he was fascinated by what he saw as an extremely young, vigorous civilization and society, and he saw it as the future, and so on. So I suppose his, um, I suppose his views of the West, there, there was a central ambiguity and contradiction. But he was a man of the West. I mean, there could be no, no question about that. He was a man of the West, of the socialist wing of the West, but nevertheless. I think virtually all his intellectual formative readings, all the individuals who he tremendously admired as thinkers um, were basically Western, Western yes. intellectuals. Yes. And uh, to be fair to James, there is a lot to love America for, and um, people of African descent okay. have uh, expressed that love okay. uh, tremendously over okay. history. But notice when he was in America, he didn't necessarily move primarily in African American circles. No. Uh, the no. interesting thing about James. No. He moved primarily in left-wing circles. Trotsky circles. Trotsky circles. Yes. And um, those circles, I, I get the impression, were, were genuinely multiracial. Yes. Um, many, many whites, of course, many Jewish yes. Americans, and people of different ethnicities. He, one of his closest collaborators was this Chinese-American woman, Grace Lee. Yes. Grace Box Lee. Yes. Grace Lee Box. Grace Lee Box, who was a Chinese-American. Um, so he, he didn't move primarily in an African-American ghetto, although clearly he knew some of the prominent African-American writers and, and thinkers yes. as well. But he moved in a multi-ethnic world. Mm. And I think that was true in Britain too, during his period in Britain. Yes, yes. Um, so though as a, as a much older man, he developed very close links with Pan-Africanism on both sides of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, he, he never was a person who was limited to African-American or African-Caribbean circles. Mm. So that the socialism, the Marxism, the Trotsky movement um, gave him entree to a genuinely multi-ethnic world. You know. yes. Some of his, his you know, lifelong friends, some of his patrons, because quite often James actually lived through, one has to say, handouts from left-wing, wealthy left-wing people. Mm. Um, and in many cases, those individuals were, were white, mm -hmm. you know, white, left-wing intellectuals, publishers, business.